Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 239, which reads as follows. Anupumbena medhavi tokang tokang kane kane kamaro rajata seva nindame malamattano which means gradually the wise little by little moment by moment purifies themselves from defilement from impurity just as a smith does with silver So the story behind this one is that there was a Brahmin, some Brahmin in Sawati, who went walking out of the city one day and saw the monks on their way into the city for alms and, and they would gather in a spot outside of the city because when they were in the forest they would wear their robes, uh, no they would perhaps even not wear the upper robe, just wear the lower robe in the forest and carry the upper robe, maybe not even take their outer robe, maybe take it. And when they get to a certain spot near the city, they would take the bowl, which would be under their, under their arm, like on a, in, a, in a bag, take the bowl out, put the shoes into the same bowl, wipe the shoes off first, put it in, in the, sorry, in the same bag, and they would adjust their robes to put them over both shoulders to cover themselves before they went into the city. And he saw that as they were doing this, they were standing in the grass. And because it was early morning, there was dew on the grass, and he saw that their robes got all wet. And he thought to himself, well, really, this isn't, this is unfortunate, and Someone should cut that grass And so the monks went on their way And later that day he came back with a, some sort of instrument And cut the grass A later day he came back and saw the monks gathering there again And he saw that it, it had gotten muddy in that area And he saw that, well now the grass wasn't uh, wasn't soiling, wetting their robes But it was even worse really because they were getting muddy, the robes were getting muddy if they ever dragged along the ground. You see, in Sri Lanka, when I was in Sri Lanka, the monks had this way of tucking the robe in between their legs as they put it on, very clever. But you can't always be perfect, and sometimes the robe would drag on the floor, and then it would get muddy and drag on the ground. And they thought to himself, someone should really spread some sand in that area. Sand would do the trick. And so when the monks went on their way, he came back later with some sand in a wheelbarrow maybe or some something and spread sand in the area. Came back a later day and saw that, well, now the monks had this nice sandy spot to put on their robes, but then it rained. And the monks, oh, no, no, sorry. Because they're getting ahead. Then it was very hot out. And he thought to him, and they, they were as they were putting on their robes, he saw that they were getting drenched in sweat. And he thought, these monks are all sweaty, and someone should put up a pavilion. And he put up, came back later, and maybe with some help, he, he erected a pavilion in that area for the monks. And then it rained, and he saw that, oh, these monks are getting all wet. And so he, put, he, he built a hall in the area, he thought to himself, Really what, it, what we need is a, an actual hall for these monks to gather. Maybe after they come back for alms, they could sit in the hall and eat their food. And so he built this hall and thought to himself, I should, what I should do now is I should have a, a ceremony, a celebration. I should invite all the monks together to consecrate 
the opening of this hall. And he, he went to the monastery and invited the monks. They all gathered together with the Buddha. And he fed them food. And then before the Buddha was going to teach at the end of the meal, he said to the Buddha, he, he, he related to the Buddha what he had done step by step. And the Buddha said, that's the way. He said, sadhu, it's good. And then he related this verse, he said, this is how the wise behave, little by little, moment by moment. They free themselves from malamattanu, from their own, from the defilements that exist inside themselves. Impurities, mala. This is the malavaga, so there's going to be a lot about these. this word mala, which applies to things like metal, it means impurities in the metal like silver, but of course the mind has its own impurities. So the one thing that strikes about this story, that apart from the teachings of the verse, is this, this initiative that the Brahmin had. When you read the story it just strikes you that here's a man out for a stroll and saw these monks and what did the, the, his thought the conscientiousness, the thought, thoughtfulness in his mind that led to this initiative, thinking to himself, I'll do something for these uh, religious, spiritual individuals. I know often many people are, are reluctant to engage. In, in modern times there's, a, of course, a great proportion of the of society is secular, and so there's a, sometimes an aversion to helping or getting involved with religion. But if you look at how beautiful this this uh, example, this act was of this Brahmin, he wasn't it wasn't helping some priests in a temple or uh, it, it wasn't about luxury or or organized religion. Here he was helping these renunciants, people who had left the world, who had who were living off of alms, scraps of food that were given out of kindness, almost like beggars, only not without without the begging. And it's not like he gave them anything luxurious or did anything luxurious. He just thought here was here were some people who, who needed and deserved his help. And what did he do? He did something very simple, but something that he was equipped to do. And just the going out of his way to do something is a very good example, something that, that we really need in the world, of course. It's a good example of, I think, the right way to live, a, a, an important part of what uh, goodness and betterment in the world looks like how the world becomes a better place and so I think if we focus on the verse we get uh, uh, three three lessons I think in what this looks like this work of bettering the world of bettering ourselves and of this gradual cultivation of goodness. The first lesson is that goodness doesn't come in grand gestures. That true goodness really has much more to do with small gestures, small but frequent and habitual gestures. So this idea that we sometimes overlook small gestures, we overlook the mundane goodness and jump ahead to some radical transformation, the idea that we should do something radical and I'm thinking 
particularly in in relation to spirituality we often have examples of people who who leave their lives behind and decide to become monks for example decide to radically transform their lives externally when they don't yet have the habit of transforming their their lives internally so often we see examples of people who radically transform their lives and are unable to sustain it because they haven't cultivated goodness on a momentary, gradual level. And so they actually fail and become discouraged. The second lesson is that not only does it happen with small gestures, generally, but it also happens gradually, not quickly. So again, often we have the perception that goodness should come or change should come immediately. A big step, which would be a radical shift. And, and this, this is most, uh, most easily observed in the idea that somehow we should transform, we should be able to sw uh, f switch on or switch off some quality that we like or don't like. So in the practice of meditation we see this when good or bad qualities we want to arise or we want to get rid of. We think somehow we should be able to control this. We should be able to switch them on or switch them off. We see this in people looking for results in their meditation practice when they would like for some observable change to appear. We often focus too much on results, too much on uh, some visible change that should occur rather than focusing on the actual activity. This, this example of the story is mundane and there's no question that this is outside of the path which leads to enlightenment. There's nothing profound about the Brahman's activities, but there is something profound about his attitude which lends itself very nicely, very well to the practice and the path leading to enlightenment. It's a, an approach that is both uh, small, focused on the ordinary activities, not some grand, uh, radical act. And also it's patient. So it was doing good when he saw some good could be done. And I think those two qualities are an important lesson. And the third lesson is that not only should we see that good comes little by little and moment by moment, But that seeing or, or looking at goodness from that perspective is in itself the goal, you know, the, good, the proper state. If we think about mindfulness meditation practice, it's always focused on the present moment, which really means that this perspective of moments of goodness, the perspective, not just that some great goodness some profound change in who we are should come through moments, but that that is the change that we should seek. The change from trying to gain something in the future to being good and focused on the good here in the present. If you think about what it would mean if we were all thoughtful and conscientious like this Brahman, not just in helping monks, who go on alms round, but in everything we do. When you see someone on the side of the road who uh, begging for food, thoughtfulness to give them some food. When someone you know needs your help, uh, 
overcoming your selfishness to help them, to support them. Taking the initiative to better yourself moment by moment, not to say, oh, every year I'm going to go and do a meditation course and then that will change who I am, or even every day I'm going to do an hour of meditation or two hours of meditation and that will change me. But to think every moment I'm going to try to approach that moment in a pure and, and a wholesome way. Tokang tokang kane kane. That the practice of momentary and, and ordinary goodness is the the way that we want to attain. It's the, the way of life of an enlightened one. And it fits very well with our uh, teaching on meditation That we should focus on the moments Not the past, not the future It, it helps us to understand What we mean by momentary concentration Because one of the great concerns that new meditators have in this tradition is the lack of deep, uh, powerful concentration that they might find in other meditation traditions. It is possible to cultivate, even fairly quickly, a sort of an artificial state of concentration that comes on strong but evaporates just as quickly because it's artificial which is very different from the habitual focus and concentration that comes from cultivating moment by moment clarity of mind, purity of mind, goodness of mind. And so this perspective of doing things not in some big or grand way, not quickly or rushed, not reaching ahead for some goal, but moment by moment, patiently, in a very mundane and ordinary way, saying to ourselves, pain, pain, and then not jumping ahead and say, what did it get me? But cultivating it as, as the goal. The goal is to be that sort of person who is thoughtful and conscientious and present. And this is a good sign that this Brahman expressed or, or and exhibited. It's a good it's a good sign to see that he had this conscientiousness, he was thoughtful, he was present. When he saw something he could do, he did it. I think it's an example we could all learn from. So a fairly simple teaching, something that has profound implications on our understanding of the practice, I think. That we look at it as a, a little by little practice, a moment by moment practice, and a practice for itself. That our way of practicing, our approach to the practice, should be momentary, should be all about the moment, not about some grand or radical shift or some goal that we might gain in the future. We do good for goodness sake. We do it because of how it changes us. If we're always looking for the goal or some grand transformation or immediate transformation, that in itself is antithetical to the path because of the greed involved, because of the control we're trying to exert, the change we're trying to create. They say enlightenment is all about change, but it's actually not. Enlightenment is about the practice. Enlightenment is change. You do change. But you change from 
seeking out goals to being the goal, to living the goal, to living as a goal, to being present, having a goal in the here and now, to changing our present, changing our moments, little by little, moment by moment. That's the Dhammapada, simple teaching. Thank you all for listening.